on our YouTube channel. So please visit that. So let's begin. She came, coming from an intercollegiate athlete and English literature major from an Eastern college, begat a volcanologist, an amazing individual whose highlights include an impressive resume packed with accomplishments, including working with the USGS, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Jess Phoenix has also been honored by both the Explorers Club and the Royal Geographical Society. She continues to host shows on Discovery Channel and the Science Channel, and she also has a podcast called Catastrophe. She's run for Congress, and now she, her and her husband run a nonprofit, BlueprintEarth.org. But now we can add author to an impressive, already impressive resume. Her book, Ms. Adventure, My Wild Explorations in Science, Lava, and Life, is an amazing book I've thoroughly enjoyed. And if you don't believe me, you should hear it from Pat Oswalt, the famous actor who says, open this book and jump into the volcano. Please welcome Jess Phoenix. Hi, Jess. Hello, I think I'm, I'll be showing up in a second here. I hope, I hope. Oop. Can you see me? Let's okay. see. Not quite yet. Okay, I've clicked the button. Let's see. That's weird. Video. Okay. That's odd. Okay, well, I'm here and I didn't change anything, but for some reason it's not wanting to, to turn the webcam on. Let's see if I can invite. It says you're on, I think. Yeah, it's weird. I'm they've just been looking at the computer. Let's see, video settings again. Uh, I jinxed it by telling you to <laughs> turn the video the off. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Well, you know, I can jump out and come right back in. Yeah, why don't we go ahead and do that? Okay, I'll be right back. Sorry, everyone. Okay. <laughs> And hi, I'm, but thank you for having me. Uh, and we're, we're getting through the technical difficulties. Um, I, some people may have heard um, my husband, Carlos, and I are in the process of adopting a, a kid from foster care and we yeah. had to go out of town. We're not, this is not my house. Uh, <laughs> first time out of town in like a year and it's mildly terrifying, but it's actually really encouraging to see how everybody is taking the rules seriously. So Oh, fingers crossed. We're almost we're okay. almost out of the tunnel, I think. <laughs> fingers crossed from everybody. So welcome and thanks for coming. And I I gotta ask before you start reading though, what's up with Pat and Oswald and you? <sighs> well, okay. So I, I have actually followed Patton on stage, uh, which I would say is something that I never thought would be on my resume. Um you know, he's pretty much legendary in the comedic world. And he took an interest when I was running for Congress. He liked my platform, liked that I came from a scientific background. And uh, he's a pretty awesome guy himself. He's very socially minded and tries to use his powers for good. And so when I told him, I said, you know, I'm, I'm haven't, not running again, but I've got this book. Would you mind taking a look at it? He did. And then unprompted he wrote the the little blurb that's on the cover he that was all mm -hmm. him so he's he and his wife meredith and their daughter alice they're just some of the nicest people that you could ever imagine you've you've gotten a lot of great feedback on this book from a lot of people and so let's jump right into it and if you don't mind sharing some of it i think that there's a part that you wanted to read yes and it's not very long uh and it is something that um, it basically just the, all the info you need to know is that this is in Hawaii on Kilauea volcano and I'm with a colleague Matt who's a volcanologist still at the volcano observatory there in Hawaii and this was my first time out uh, in the lava flow fields so that's the context. <laughs> Here we go. Matt gave me a few minutes to marvel at this deadliest of rivers before redirecting us to our task of locating an active flow. 
another half mile or so of carefully hiking across the flow field, avoiding the dicey newest flows and checking the handheld GPS units with the most recent flow maps brought us to the edge of an oozing silver puddle that reminded me of a thicker version of the T-1000 Terminator in its liquid form. I gawked at the active Pahoehoe flow and Matt smiled. He seemed to appreciate my newcomer's enthusiasm. What I saw was something that my limited experience told me had no right to exist. Rock was solid, it was firm, if occasionally brittle. It was dependable. Houses, fortresses, tools, and weapons can be built from it. Rock was static. It changed only slowly, only with great effort or great force. Yet, here I was, a few feet from silver rock that was clearly alive in a way that only science or wizardry could explain. While Matt dug the sampling supplies out of his pack, I thought about what it must have been like to grow up in Hawaii before modern science could explain volcanoes. Of course, a goddess would have been a logical explanation for ground that could give birth to itself, sometimes destroying lives in the process. What other than something divine could make the solid earth turn to liquid fire? Nudging me out of my reverie, Matt handed me a full face balaclava and silver gloves that were made for someone with much larger hands than mine. I donned the balaclava with care, leaving my sunglasses in place. Then I pulled on the gloves and assessed the heat resistant silver. It matched the lava oozing in the background. Matt passed me a metal coffee can filled halfway with water and a rock hammer that I would use to pull off some of the molten rock. I approached the flow guardedly. My goal was to get close enough to stick the pointed pick end of the hammer into one of the flow's toes. As I drew closer, the heat grew more intense than anything I'd ever felt. The flow I was targeting was in excess of 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit, which is nearly four times hotter than the highest setting on an oven. It seemed as if nature had hushed itself unbidden, except for my heartbeat, which was jackhammering in my ears. I paused, eyeballing potential targets and not wanting to get closer to that outrageous heat until I knew for certain where I would strike. I set the coffee can down behind me and decided on a nice fat lobe of lava about six feet away that was slowly bobbing towards my right foot. Faintly, I heard a tinkle that sounded like tiny pieces of glass being crunched ever so gently. The lava was making an almost musical sound as the new flow rolled over the older ground beneath. Between that and the radiating waves of heat that were hitting me full force, it felt like a dream. I couldn't take the heat much longer, so I clenched my teeth and stepped toward the flow, right arm extended with the hammer pick pointing down. Suddenly, my eyes felt like they were being sandblasted. At Matt's direction, I had kept my sunglasses on, so I tried blinking. The awful feeling remained, and I recognized my eyes were dehydrating. I needed to hurry, or my vision might end up more compromised than it already was, and one errant movement could result in serious burns. I took one last step, shielded my eyes with my gloved left hand, enough to deflect some of the searing air, planted my right foot 10 inches from the flow, and stuck the pick into the living silvery glob. Feeling no resistance, I pulled up slowly, straining against the heat to see what was happening on the end of the hammer. The lava followed the hammer's path, some of its sticky bulk attached to the pick, with the rest fighting to stay part of the flow. The taffy from hell stretched vivid and red, the insubstantial silver crust broken by the hammer, the flow's dazzling scarlet insides exposed to the world. I kept pulling and freed a glob, the molten rock tendrils oozing back to the bulk of the flow. I pivoted, shaking the hammer to make the glob release its hold. It fell into the waiting coffee can and the water inside crackled to life, boiling instantly thanks to the scorching lava bleb I had dropped. Steam rose from the can as the sample was hyper-quenched, solidifying it and preserving the information 
contained inside its primordial makeup. As soon as the boiling stopped, I picked up the can and rejoined Matt at a safe distance from the lava flow front. Relieved to be in cooler air and ecstatic about all things lava, I couldn't stop grinning. We packed up the sample and trekked off to map the lava flow that was currently burning an isolated island of green amid this sea of black. Wow. Sorry? <laughs> wow. Thank you. Um, it's, I love that part because that was the moment I like everything, you know, when you have the little emoji with the head exploding, like that mm -hmm. was what was happening to me. <laughs> oh my gosh. And <laughs> just that feeling of your eyes dehydrating and was there fear involved here? I mean, I think not so much. And maybe that's because, um, what you mentioned earlier, I did, I've played mm. sports at, at very high levels of competition. Um, I've competed internationally, competed in the NCAA. Um, and just, I played all sorts of sports for fun too, as a kid. So I got really used to performing when the pressure was on. So for me, you know, this was like, okay, I've got to do this. And you don't even think about screwing up. It's just, it's not an option. It's just, this is the job here's what I'm going to do to get the job done. And I've got all senses firing on high. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. So you're able to lock, just totally lock in on what you're doing then without having any kind of peripheral distractions or anything like that. Yes. And I mean, it's a pretty good ability. I mean, it's helped a lot because my work has taken me, I mean, I just was filming a, a TV series for discovery that's premiering in like a month and a half uh, called hunting Atlantis. And I rappel huh? down one, one of the largest sinkholes on earth in the show. And I, I know everyone on the crew was mildly terrified. And I'm like, yep, no, I've got a job to do. I've got to go do this. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just, it's just how the mentality works, I think. I, I want to talk about TV in a little bit, but I want to get to your writing because the love of your subject obviously shows in your writing. And it flows lyrically much like a lot less scientifically, but a little more lyrically with Mark Twain, who wrote a lot about Kilauea, you know, in the, you know, in way back when. But I see the, the flow, the lyric and everything. Was this, was writing something that you always wanted to do? I actually never thought I would be a writer. I, I thought, um... I was going to be an English major. That's what I started college mm -hmm. as. I, I graduated high school absolutely obsessed with T.S. Eliot. And if I was wearing mm -hmm. a, a short sleeve shirt, you could see I have Eliot quotes tattooed on my forearm. <laughs> so it's, it's definitely a lifelong love. Um, but I always thought that I would be um, reading other people's work. I never really thought that anything that my life would involve would be of interest uh, for people to read about. But then mm -hmm. I went into volcanology and you know, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> People want to hear about it. So I thought, okay, these stories that I have, and there are so many, I mean, there are so many that didn't make the book. I, I could write a second and third and fourth books and I'd probably still have content. So there's a lot there. There is a lot there. You picked certain aspects. I, it seemed to me that there were certain aspects that were seminal moments in your life as a volcanologist. Would you say that's how you decided to divide the book up into different chapters. You went from Hawaii, three chapters, to Peru, Ecuador, Mexico. Yeah, it's it was kind of um, a choice to put things into episodes. So specific expeditions, mm -hmm. or in the case of Hawaii, I thought, what better way to divide it than by the three volcanoes that I worked on while I was there? So it, it was like, I need either to pin these things in a, in a place or in a time. And sometimes it, the two sort of uh, overlapped, but it was a helpful way to organize. And the best tip I got was um, I, I actually did an MFA in nonfiction. So I have, I have multiple graduate degrees, none of which are in English, but it's, it's funny how things work out. But, they, uh, but one of my MFA advisors said, uh, actually the very first one I worked with said, why don't you just make a timeline? Because I had no idea how to start. And starting is the hardest mm -hmm. thing that I found in writing is just getting that pen on the paper or your hands on the keyboard. And when she said, just make a timeline and say where you were and what you were doing professionally, and also maybe what was going on in your personal life, and then also what was going on in the world. And, and that kind of contextualizing was infinitely helpful uh, to saying, mm -hmm. okay, you know, 
Peru was happening, Mexico was happening. Yeah, these were specific times for me in my life. So that was really, really useful information that I got. Interesting. This is all funny because there's, you didn't start out this way. Like you, you said, you were, you went to Smith College to study English literature. Yes. And then you somehow ended up in Death Valley. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's, it, you know, and that's, I guess the way that I have managed to live my life is when one door slams shut for whatever reason, I try to, I don't try to kick it back open. I say, all right, well, let's just go to an entirely different house <laughs> and try there. Mm -hmm. And and so I've made some pretty right turns, I guess you could say 90 degree shifts in what I've been doing. But um, one thing that I've always kind of held in the back of my head is when things go really wrong, I've told myself, well, this will make a great story. And weirdly enough, it kind of does. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what, in terms of your subject matter focus on volcanoes, what was the alert of volcanoes and, and why did they grip you the way they did for to devote your whole life to them? Okay, so the easiest thing, the easiest way to put it into words, because it really is, it's just too enormous to really encapsulate mm -hmm. successfully in like a couple of sentences. But the best way I can do it justice is to say, uh, volcanoes are the only thing on earth that I've ever seen that is you know, completely unrelated to humans, uh, unaffected by our presence. And it is pure power that can both create and destroy. So we're talking about uh, you know, something that can kill thousands of people at once, uh, wipe out entire cities and, and just devastate people. But it can also, and it also does, create new land. I mean, this is planet mm -hmm. Earth giving birth to itself. And at its pure, raw, fundamental state, I mean, what else on our planet is so truly creation and destruction, that duality all in one? And mm -hmm. so to me, that's that's a volcano. It's life, it's death, and it's everything in between. You Do you get a rush out of it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's there is nothing yeah. that will get the blood pumping quite like, well, I, the last few weeks I've been spoiled for choice because Mount Etna in Sicily is, mm -hmm. you know, going like crazy. You've got, um, you know, in, in Iceland, you've got um, Bagradalsfjall, which is just the one we are getting the drone footage of with just so much roiling lava. They're killing drones, but it's worth it if the end result is those videos. And then, of course, mm -hmm. Kilauea has been erupting again. It had a two-year pause from 2018 to 2020, but it mm -hmm. started again in December. So we've got so many volcanoes, and that doesn't even count the other 40-plus that are erupting right now. I mean, at any given moment, we've got about 45 eruptions going on worldwide. So it's you show me a volcano erupting or even one just sort of waking up, and I am I'm 100% there, like, let's go. <laughs> Are you, are you itching to get out? Is, is COVID preventing you from being able to? Get yes, there? yes. It's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's been um, a real hindrance on doing research because we don't operate in a vacuum as scientists. I mean, every mm -hmm. expedition that you're on, you have a team. I mean, unless you're not doing a science expedition and you're just trying to like be a, a solo person to the North Pole or something. Uh, but scientific expeditions, you have people with different expertise. And on some expeditions, you even have a cook or wranglers for the horses if you have to pack equipment in and out. So it's, it's a very team effort when you go and you work on volcanoes or you, know, you do climate change research, any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, they're not in our social groups, basically. They weren't in our bubble. Mm -hmm. So we basically have said, okay, let's, let's put the brakes on anything unnecessary. And I was just starting mm -hmm. to, um, I've actually assembled a team of scientists to go to the world's um, most recently discovered lava lake that is two degrees north of the Antarctic Circle. And wow. no one is, yeah, no one's ever laid eyes on it uh, because this island, nobody ever lived there. There's no evidence that anyone, it's so remote. It's off the, it's the South Sandwich Islands is the island chain. Mm -hmm. It's basically a thousand miles east of the bottom of Argentina. So it is, it's in the middle of nowhere. And we were going to get an expedition together. And then um, with COVID, I, I said, I can't very well go out and try to fundraise for this expedition right now. So mm -hmm. it is definitely put a, a damper on all of our efforts uh, mm -hmm. other than that, which is purely essential right now. You had mentioned just now about team and what I really liked about 
not only your writing, but the book, just about science in general is how everybody, the mutual respect involved with everyone. And you, I guess because you were newer, you acted more deferential to some, to some of the members. Um, I'd like you to talk about working with a team of people who are at the best in the world at what they do. At first, it's going to be intimidating. <clears throat> I think that's a normal response is to, to see people who do this and it's their way of life. It's their day-to-day mm -hmm. thing. It's, you know, for some people, uh, they're accountants and their, their business is numbers and ledgers and they understand balance sheets. And that's totally normal. To another person, it's like a whole new world. And it's the same thing with volcanoes. I mean, to some people, it's just another day at the office. And mm -hmm. um, I, I was raised to be very uh, polite to people who are you know, more senior in their role than I am. Uh, but I do want to say that something that didn't make the book, but that was really, really helpful for me as a young scientist was um, when I started my graduate work at Cal State LA, I went to there for my master's in geology. And when I got to the department, um, the department chair, Dr. Kim Bishop, I was like, oh, Dr. Bishop, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, no, 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 don't call me that. He said, call me Kim. And I said, really? And he said, yes, we are colleagues. Like we, we are working together. And you know, you've already earned your bachelor's. Now you're a geologist, you're doing geology. So am I, call me Kim. And I was like, I was floored because he was saying not only like you're accepted, but it was, it was like, you're welcome here. We want you to feel like this is where you belong to. And that made a strong mm. impression on me. So that's when I teach students, um, I, I tell them, hey, first name is fine. And, um, and some students are more or less comfortable depending on how they were raised, yeah. but it, it definitely does help when we're in the field because I, I don't want people yelling, you know, a whole long name at me or some title, like, just call me, just call me Jess. It's one syllable. <laughs> <laughs> But um, along that lines, they're mostly collegial, but did you encounter any sexism <laughs> when you were as being a woman and being younger? Yes, uh, there, there has been some. I was really lucky. Most of my mentors were actually men who were extremely supportive and encouraging. But there, there have been some instances um, where people have shown favoritism or where a situation has been unpleasant because of either expectations about what women can and shouldn't do or you know basically just old ways of thinking but then also from other women I mean there it because geology for so long has been a very male dominated profession oftentimes well not oftentimes but there have been a couple of instances like literally two uh, where I've had a, another woman in a position of power want to close the door, not just on me, but on other women following behind. And I think it's, you get very um, worried that you're like, wait, no, I got this place here finally. How can I hang on to it? I can't let other people in. And that mentality to me is really harmful because it excludes so many brilliant young folks and, and scientists of all ages. Like one of my best friends went back and got her uh, bachelor's in her 50s and is now a fantastic biologist. And it's just basically you have to be willing to say, yes, let me open the door for you. Like just open the door, get out of the way, let people walk through. And I think that's why uh -huh. we're starting to see more diversity in science now. We're seeing a better representation of the true breadth of scientific curiosity. And, mm -hmm. and that's why we see so many more women doing science and people of color and people with disabilities because I mean, hey, like we need all hands on deck. This is the mm -hmm. problems we're dealing with are global. So we need everybody who can engage to be engaged. Interesting. There was one team member though that you respected immensely. However, they didn't give you the time of day. And I'm talking about Jason. <laughs> Yes. And if you could tell the audience about Jason and integration of technology and science, if you could talk a little bit about that. So a lot of people know, as, as I described in that little passage, that my scientific instruments in that case were a hammer and a can, a coffee can. So nothing too high tech, but there are times where we use these really advanced tools. And Jason is the name comes from Jason and the Argonauts of, uh, you know, old Greek mythology. And um, Jason is a submersible. It's the ROV, Remote Operated Vehicle Jason. And I actually used Jason 2 for my work. The original Jason was the submersible they used to discover the Titanic. 
on the seafloor. Jason oh. two is still in service today and goes all over earth basically well all over the oceans of the earth and we pilot jason um it's actually that's the team effort too jason has about three pilots at any given moment and uh, that's because there's the the submersible itself and there's a long cable several miles of cable tethering it to an electronic brain that goes in the water as well and then also it's got um another cable that goes from the brain to the ship so you've got to control where the ship is, where the brain is, and where the submersible is. And we have to use that submersible because it is, I mean, the only other option is basically to send a manned submersible like Alvin down to the seafloor. And sometimes other people have dibs. So we basically say, what submersible can we get? What funding are we getting? Like, who is going to pay for this? And then we, we get the, the crew and the tools that we can, and we go down and use these robots to go into places that, you know, you or I can't just walk in, like, you know, basically 5,000 plus meters below the, the surface of the ocean. We're mm. talking over 15,000 feet deep. And I wow. did research on a volcano down at that depth off the coast of Hawaii. And it's pretty cool. I did get to pilot Jason briefly, and I'm thinking they wish that they didn't let me drive it. Because uh, on the on the front end, there are spikes about six inches long. They're they're steel. And that Jason looks like a big box, like a fancy microwave with a couple of robot arms on it. And um, that's it's not doesn't have to be aerodynamic. It only goes one knot, which is a little around a mile an hour underwater. So, mm -hmm. you know, when I was piloting this thing along the seafloor, I uh, kept running it into the ground <laughs> because it's. <laughs> It's it's harder than a video game, folks. Um, I'm just saying. So if you thought it was like Super Mario Brothers, it is not. And Jason also costs about seven million dollars. So there's a significantly higher penalty if you you know kill your little guy. <laughs> uh -huh. In this case, uh, yeah, I didn't kill Jason, but there's a reason they put those steel spikes on the front. And you drove this uh, near the Loihi Seamount, right? Yes, that's the next Hawaiian island. <laughs> okay, if you can. Yeah, if you can briefly tell people, I mean, who don't know, this is an amazing thing that's not going to happen in our lifetime, of course, but. Yeah, so the Hawaiian islands are, you know, they're a chain and the islands that are to the northwest are older than the islands to the southeast. So the big island of Hawaii, uh, which is home to Hilo and Kona and the Iron Man um, and the major volcanoes like Kilauea and Mount Loa and all the observatories, the, the, the telescopes on top of Mount Akea, it's, it's all volcanic. And then off the coast of the Big yeah. Island, you have the Loihi Seamount. And the summit of Loihi is about a, a thousand meters below the surface. So it's not going to come up anytime soon. Uh, <laughs> probably take another eh, many tens of thousands of years. We'll put it that way. Uh, but Loihi is basically the latest in the formation of the Hawaiian island chain. And the hotspot mm -hmm. that's feeding the Hawaiian islands is hypothesized to be relatively stable. And it's the Pacific tectonic plate that is sliding across the hotspot. And we can observe some of that tectonic motion uh, just via the San Andreas Fault. Because we are, if you're on, in LA or Santa Barbara, you're on the Pacific plate, the part that is mm -hmm. going across Hawaii. If you cross the mountains, you know, and you're, you're over onto the North American plate, we can't help you. But uh, <laughs> the Pacific plate is pretty interesting for a lot of reasons. That's really interesting. Earlier, you mentioned also about funding and technology, and you had a chance, your first experience was with the Discovery Channel hosting a show. And there were some challenges involved with that, weren't there? Is that the right photo? Uh, yes, that's so I was actually they the people running things at Discovery at that point were not familiar with science. I mean, that was that was obvious. And now obviously I'm making another show with them or the show is shot. We just need to get it out there onto the airwaves. But they have they've definitely changed in how they deal with science and how they listen to scientists. So I'm pleased with how things are changing because then this photo. Um, they initially told us the show would be called Trailblazers, and it would be uh, showing scientists around the world doing trailblazing research. And so 
the gentleman on the left was Jeff Johnson. He's a, oh. a volcano geophysicist. I, I just, I'll just mention he was up at Boise State. He's still there. And the guy in the middle was a Navy SEAL named Sean. And um, oh yeah, there he is again. So Sean's in the middle and he you know, served in Afghanistan and Iraq and, and he's a really great guy. They didn't tell us we'd be working with Sean initially. They told me and Jeff and then the other scientists in the other locations um, that we were the trailblazers. We got down there, to, in our case, to Ecuador, and they said, oh, no, the Navy SEAL is going to be the trailblazer, and you guys are the nerdy lab rats who are afraid to leave your office, and he, you need his help to go to the volcano. And we're like, what? I mean, Jeff had worked on Reventador like 10 times already at that point. And I'm like, yeah, I do this stuff. Like, this is my, this is my actual job. Why would I be afraid of doing my own job? And so the production had a lot of challenges. They wanted us to basically be actors. And I'm like, look, I can act. Like it's, that's something I can do, but you hired me to put my name on this. So we need to protect our reputations. And I have to say though, that it, it was not so much the, the production company or the crew, they were, they were great. It was the, the lack of understanding at the top. Mm -hmm. And fortunately that was something that now that I've worked with Science Channel more and um, I've even done like Weather Channel stuff and Travel Channel and this other show on Discovery, I said, look, you have to take me seriously as a scientist. You're paying for my expertise in doing expeditions in remote areas. Like mm -hmm. I'm not a lab rat and that's all I do. I, I do this stuff for a living and I made it very clear. And I think they've done a good job of understanding that. And so I just hope that they will uh, continue to show that scientists are they're diverse. I mean, the local mm -hmm. experts with volcanoes are going to be the people with the best expertise. So you got to feature them too. It can't just be, you know, American white volcanologists parachuting in to save the day. That doesn't work. Like you've got to show mm -hmm. the reality because I promise it is every bit as good as anything in fiction. Like if they just let us tell the story mm -hmm. the right way. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think you had written too about you wanted some of the ancillary characters in the shot and they weren't in the shot. So you kind of advocated for them to be, to do so. Yes. And I still, I still have to do that. I actually have some cool photos now from different shoots uh, since mm -hmm. the, the trailblazer shoot. Uh, and it was been so much better. Like I know in one show I did uh, with the science channel, I did a segment for their what on earth program and they, um, they actually have me speaking through an, uh, a local interpreter to a Maasai elder because I needed permission to go do science work up on Old Doño Langai volcano, which is the Maasai oh. tribe's mountain of God. And so since then, I've been like, no, no, we got to get this on camera. This is important. Um, we got to make sure that we keep that stuff in there. And if there are local scientists, show me talking to them. I don't know everything. And I think we've done like the, the newest show. I'm actually pretty excited to see how people like it because mm -hmm. I think it's, I mean, I'm one of the co-hosts and then my friend Stel Pavlo is the other co-host and he's mm -hmm. a person of color and I'm a woman. So we're yeah. getting more diversity. It's happening little by little. <laughs> <laughs> it, talk you know, ask, answer about the challenge. So you, you want to entertain, but you want to educate correctly. But on the other end, there's also the funding. So you have to do it a certain way that they want to. So how difficult it is, is it to balance all those different factors at the same time? I think it's, you know, it's a bit of a challenge, especially when you're starting. And then when you're more comfortable with it, it's if you make your your work a largely external focused, um, which is what I've done. There are a lot of people who, you know, there are a lot of volcanologists around the world who you'll never know their names, but they are brilliant scientists. I mean, far better than I will ever be as a scientist purely um, mm -hmm. because they focus all their time on doing the research. I have said, I can communicate with the public. I can make these really complex concepts interesting and fun and simple and accessible. So let me go do that. And I will advocate, I will try to get people interested in this stuff so we can get more funding. And mm. it's, I think we're seeing, um, I was really encouraged by the news conference that the president gave the other day, because he said, you know, right now science funding is like 0.7% of the budget. And he said, I want to get it back up to 2%. And, mm -hmm. you know, 
that's enough for a party right now, but I can tell you we need a lot more funding for science research and for science communication. And we can make it awesome. I'm telling you this stuff, all kinds of science are just absolutely fascinating. I mean, I will talk to you about microbes and, and cloud patterns as easily as I will talk to you about volcanoes because it's all absolutely fascinating. So do you think that we're on an upswing in terms of science awareness and acceptance? I mean, you ran your uh, congressional platform, I think it's 25th District LA, uh, on science and, and you got a lot of votes but not quite over the top. And it's too bad you didn't win because of the mess in the 25th district right now. But anyway, um, do you feel now that there is going to be kind of a more positive swing toward science, toward funding science, toward awareness of science, or is it still an uphill battle? Well, I think it's both at once. I think we we do have a bit of a, a swing in the positive direction. And I'd like to think that my campaign was helpful in that um, because it did get a lot of press, both nationally and internationally, uh, because most people don't think of scientists as politically engaged. And it's you can't shut off being a human just because you're also a scientist. I mean, these mm -hmm. policies affect you too. I mean, there are plenty of scientists who um, are, are living in like basically close to poverty conditions if they're postgraduate students um, or grad students. And then you've gotten scientists subject to racism and sexism and misogyny, I mean, sexism, misogyny, same thing, but ableism. And I mean, basically you throw an ism out there, there are scientists who have experienced or are experiencing that. So the way mm -hmm. we fix those things is policy, education and policy. And so now I think that more scientists are realizing that, you know, just having scientists after your name doesn't give you the right to sit on your hands when it comes to understanding policy and how it's affecting every aspect of our lives. So mm. I'm really encouraged a lot because of what I saw when I was running. And it wasn't, it wasn't the, you know, the old school political donor folks who we appreciate, but it wasn't them that inspired me. It wasn't the current mm. politicians in office who inspired me. It was the young people. And that's because they, they approach things with a very keen sense of, of empathy. And that is what I think mm -hmm. we need. We need to interpret all of the data that we see around us as, as you know, scientifically as possible, but then we have to implement our policies backed with empathy for each other, mm -hmm. for the planet, and for what other people are going through. And I think that is the thing that will carry us through this really challenging time in history with climate change and you know, growing population, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Is that why you started with Carlos, your husband, uh, BlueprintEarth.org? Is that your uh, nonprofit? Yes, we. So actually, um, when my career had taken another weird turn, as it does, I uh, I worked in natural resources for a while, and now I'm a total like hippie tree hugger environmentalist, and I worked in mining. I can say that because you know, mm. mining is necessary. It, I mean, it, it sucks, but it is. And until we, you know, I'm communicating with you via a smartphone and it has rare earth elements in it that we need to extract from the ground. Mm. And anyone who's watching this on a computer or a phone, same deal. So until we get to a point where we can synthesize everything we need, unfortunately, we still need to extract resources from the land around us. And I thought with Blueprint Earth, the idea was let's take the industry approach to standardizing an analysis of something and then the academic approach of, well, how does it all fit together? And so we look at with Blueprint Earth's work, we take teams of scientists and students out to our first environment, which is California's Mojave Desert, and we see how everything connects. So it's not just geologists, like we have biologists and um, archeologists now, we have atmospheric scientists, hydrologists and engineers, and we work in an interdisciplinary way where everybody's connecting with everybody else and seeing how they do their work. And it's really giving us a, a chance to educate young, well, young college age students. So 18 to you know 20s and 30s age students about how to do field research and it's no cost to them. Uh, because mm -hmm. again, I wanna open the door and get out of the way for people. So that's mm -hmm. part of that effort. And 
Um, we also are, are seeing how everything connects as a system. I mean, you pull, uh, John Muir made a, had a really good quote about pulling at one thread and every, see how everything is connected. It's, I'm paraphrasing heavily, but it's true. And I mean, you cannot have bighorn sheep without specific microbes in the, in the soil crust that make the plants grow that the sheep eat, you know? So this is, this is the way that our world works. And it is really important that we understand this stuff. And I will say too, on the diversity angle that Blueprint Earth has been really successful with, because the program is no cost to our students, when a student gets accepted, if we can, we need to get them to either LA or Vegas, if they can get to one of those places, from there out to do research, everything is covered. So that's individual donors and grants. Um, we can give the students a no cost experience that normally they'd have to wow. pay a few, few thousand bucks for. So um, it's been really neat to see. We've had like 76% women participants and 54% are students of color and 60% come from low income backgrounds. So th to me, that's it. That's the science of the future. So we're just trying to mm -hmm bring the understanding of environments and the knowledge that exists in diverse communities to, to bear, to solve these big picture problems. Wow. And this is a nonprofit too. So obviously we need some funding. So if you're out there, please check out blueprintearth.org. <laughs> Um, yes, I'll, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> little plug there. I've got a couple more questions, but if anybody else would like to type in, please do. Um, back to the book. Is what did you, is there anything that you learned about yourself from this whole experience of writing this book? And and yeah, what did you learn about yourself maybe that you didn't know before? I think I and and this is funny, like during the writing process, I just I just got it out there and then I edited. I hate editing. I knew that already from high, uh, high school and college papers. I hate editing, um, but it's necessary. But with this book, um, for me, what's been really revelatory has been the response. Uh, I've had so many people tell me like either online or in person, like, well, like who my, my, my quarantine buddies in person, I guess everyone else has been virtually like via Zoom. Um, mm -hmm. It's their really, they tell me that it feels like they were there. And so what that taught yeah. me is that I can make people feel things with my words and in my written words, because I know I can do it. I mean, I ran for Congress. I know I can make people feel urgency or, or um, civic duty, civic pride. I can do that. But now to know that my written word can, can convey even just a tiny portion of the awe and splendor and majesty of the natural world. I mean, that I have been so lucky to witness like that, that was a huge deal because I know that most people won't get to go to the places that I've been. And mm -hmm. I really think that if you are somebody in life who is fortunate enough to be able to do amazing, unforgettable things, you need to share that with people, however yeah. you can. So I can do it. That's what I learned. I'm like, I can write stuff and people will say it felt like I was there. And then that just makes my whole day because I, if I could bring everyone to all of these places, I'm like, I'm utterly convinced that everybody would be a nature lover because it is spe <laughs> it, it's spectacular. I mean, I don't even know yeah. enough good adjectives for it. <laughs> You'll think of something because you still have to write another book because <laughs> this is just the early part of your life. But what I really, we had talked about off before this started is what I really enjoyed about your book was you gave us a sense of place and you put us in that position and you made it accessible for those who don't know science, people like me. And, but you also made it technical enough for those who know science that they're really gonna get something out of it. So thank you for writing this book. Thank you, Michael. I mean, I'm 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 glad it's made people happy. That was kind of the goal. <laughs> well, that... Oops. I think I can't hear you. Oops. Here we go. Oh, Is that yes, better? yes, I can hear you okay. now. Okay, I muted myself. Benjamin uh... has. Benjamin, first of all, thanks you so much for your time and your work. Oh, well, thank and you. <laughs> he's got three questions. So the first is, if we can answer them one by one, do you discuss your political ca political campaign in your in your book? Just at the very end, um, the last chapter is 
the most recent part of the book. And um, it's basically how I decided to run. And then how I sort of, I guess, girded my loins for going into the fray of politics after being so blissful doing science for several years. So it's just at the end, um, I didn't want to go into the politics side of things too much because I wanted the book to be about the exploration and, and the natural world. I wanted that to be the like the star of the book. Interesting. So his next question is, how can international carbon treaties example, the Paris Agreement, take the release of emissions from non-human sources like volcanoes into account? That's a great question. And the good news is, despite what some sources of misinformation that are trying to get you to click will tell you, volcanoes produce far fewer amounts of CO2 than humans do. So ah. if you, yeah, like we, so people, um, People produce a ton of CO2, like, okay, way more than a ton, but you know what I'm saying? Volcanoes produce less than 1% of all of the CO2 that humans produce annually. So less than 1%. So at this point, um, you know, the only other natural things that are causing the problem is the burning of the fossil fuels themselves. And those wouldn't burn if we weren't burning them. So it's uh... really, it's, this is a human caused problem that we're dealing with. Yes, climate shifts. Um, it has always shifted. We have evidence in the rock record. It just shifting this dramatically in this short a time span, that's on us. Mm. And his last question is, how can he purchase an autographed copy of your book? Well, I'm, I'm working on that with, uh, with my publisher. So um, you can stay tuned. I would say check... Um, by the end of the week, I think, is when we're going to have it figured out. But we are getting a mechanism where people can order autograph copies. Um, so mm -hmm. I would say check um, on workman.com. Um, you can look me up under the authors or check on Timber Press on their website. And uh, it's timberpress.com. And just look back on like Thursday or Friday. We will have something by the end of the week, I have been told. <laughs> I have a question from a customer who couldn't make it tonight, but who has a daughter and who is very interested in what you do and what would what kind of advice would you give to a young girl to be a scientist or a volcanologist, I should say? Okay, so the first the first and best rule is tell everyone what you're interested in. And of course ask questions. But basically if you say, I think volcanoes are fascinating. Tell everybody, even if you're, you're six or you're eight or you're 14 or you're 24 or you're 44, tell people what you love and say, you know, I'm really into volcanoes. And if you're with a bunch of other science people, tell them what about volcanoes? You gotta be specific. But the reason I say that is because people will start to associate you with that thing and they will then open doors for you. They will say, oh, you know what? Volcanoes, that's like geology, right? Um, my sister's cousin is a geologist. Would you like to talk to her? And then that's how young folks who are really just starting out, they can start to get a real idea of what the, the science involves, what that field involves. And that, mm -hmm. I mean, that goes for any discipline, not just volcanoes or science, but honestly, it's just sharing your curiosity. And that's how mm -hmm. we can find connections that maybe you wouldn't be expecting. I also heard that they should ask for a rock hammer for Christmas. <laughs> well, yes, every, everyone should ask for a rock hammer. That's just a given. Um, <laughs> but they're only between $25 and $30, but you do need to buy some shatter resistant safety goggles to use it. Okay. So, you know, kids don't be running around using a rock hammer without your safety goggles. You need your eyes. Okay. <laughs> Why well, I, I think you're going to boost the sales ever since uh, Andy Dufresne escaped Shawshank with his little rock hammer there. So they're maybe great. It'll, <laughs> maybe it'll be a trend. All right, we have one more question okay. from from Benjamin again. Oh, he just says, "Fascinating. Thank you for clarifying that about emissions." Cool. I'll take a so, comment. <laughs> <laughs> well. Everyone, I, I highly recommend this book. It's not just scientific, it's, it's lyrical, but there's also some adventure involved. And we're not talking Indiana Jones or 
something like that. I think it's something better. It's more realistic. And if you can make a little bit of, we'll close with a comment about that aspect of your work, Jess, just about what you do. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on, not just the science aspect, but. Well, I would say everybody out there, keep your, your personal curiosity fire burning bright. Um, when things seem dark, uh, that, that's what we need. We need those points of light and we need that flame inside each and every human to, to be cared for. And if you can use your curiosity, then that's what we can take to battle the ignorance that's out there that's infecting us. And it's only through being curious and being unafraid of that curiosity's result that we can solve the big problems that our world is, is faced with right now. And I mean, really, really push that curiosity along so the mm. kids can have it because they are, they are the ones who are gonna inherit whatever mess we've made. So definitely encourage the young folks in your life to ask why, and then take the time to find out the answer if nobody around you knows, uh, because you teach them how to, how to find answers and they're going to change the world for the better. Jess Phoenix, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Good luck with Ms. Adventure. It's a wonderful book and everyone please buy the book and more importantly, go um, check out blueprintearth.org and check out what, what work they're doing. Have <laughs> a nice you, evening, Michael. everyone. All right, thank you all, thank bye. You. Bye.